I think they're equally important, but very different. Well, the, uh, the others are, will be used in what you were in. That's right. But the creature criticized some of the homogeneous parents are used right now. Now, these other folks are going to be useful someday, but not now. Right, I think they're equally important to the people who are going to What's going on in my experience? I mean, I don't know if it's interesting. But they're plotting stuff out in the other place. They are never going to be afraid. Not missing the information. What lies in the future? No, no. Well, you almost have to think when they're ready to talk. If you say that that's a good idea, you like to see anything. We've got room for just exactly the other thousand years. Because every wolf in the universe has a human in the grave. The ambassador of the country. And there are exactly 700,000 human in the grave. That's the second number of human in the grave. But there are already more than 700,000 human in the grave. In one place it says more than 700,000. In another place, it says, well, nice and new. And they keep on being created. That means some creator times are never going to have a chance to function in the government of the universe. They're going to have to work for all these things. And their whole experience will be close to the same as the And that's where I get the notion they're going to be two kinds of creators. Those who have functional creators and those who have. <coughs> if they divide up outer space among the creator sons who have worked in the seventh of the universe, then each creator son is going to be responsible for something on the order of the larger than a major sector of the universe. And to me, it's quite likely that the youngest in your son will function on the way to it. But that's all special. And then what's going to happen in the second part of the second part of the much different. Ever so. Well, you know, it's not only not going to pass, it's going to get tremendously larger. Enormously large. I think you said there was someone who asked you. I think so, that There will be new. There will be new. Oh. 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 Oh.
the enigma of the emerging deity of God the Ultimate will challenge these perfected citizens of the settled universe, just as their struggling evolutionary forebears were once challenged with a quest for God the Supreme. The curtain of cosmic destiny will draw back to reveal the transcendent grandeur of the alluring absinite quest for the attainment of the universal Father on those new and higher levels revealed in the ultimate of creature things. In other words, we will find the God the Yes, and that's page I think I can find it. On page 1294, Leona, 1293 is when I read this last paragraph of the page. On 1294, they give you their philosophy of growth and then rest, then growth and then rest. Don't keep you running all the time. When you graduate as a senior, they let you stick around a while and enjoy being a graduate. You don't go to school, you teach them. They'll make you become a freshman at a higher level immediately. On page 1294, Creative growth is unending, but ever satisfying. Endless in extent, but always punctuated by those personality-satisfying moments of transient goal attainment, which serve so effectively as the mobilization prelude to new adventures in cosmic growth, universe exploration, and deity. Quiet to While the domain of mathematics is beset with qualitative limitations, it does provide the finite mind with a conceptual basis of contemplating infinity. There is no quantitative limitation to numbers, even in the comprehension of the finite mind. No matter how large the number can be, you can always envision one more being added, and also you can comprehend that that is short of infinity, for no matter how many times you repeat the tradition to numbers, still always, one more can be added. At the same time, the infinite series can be totaled at any given point. And this total, or properly a subtotal, provides the fullness of the sweetness of goal attainment for a given person at a given time and status. But sooner or later, this same person begins to hunger and yearn for new and greater goals. And such adventures and growth will be forever forthcoming in the fullness of time and the cycle of eternity. Each successive universe age is the antechamber of the following era of cosmic growth. And each universe epoch provides immediate destiny for all preceding states. Avona, in and of itself, is a perfect, but perfection-limited creation. Avona perfection, expanding out into the evolutionary super-universe, finds not only cosmic destiny, but also liberation from the limitation of pre-evolutionary existence. You know, that's so comforting, because while the final goal is not attainable, all other goals are attainable. And you have the wonderful feeling of goal attainment. And by golly, she can sit on that goal for a little while and say, but I made it. Whether it's citizenship on Jerusalem, or Edentia, or the attainment of paradise, they never push you on. They wait until you get the cheapest. When you get good and tired of being a graduate, 
and want to be a freshman, this is the indication it's time to move on to the new book. But they wait for your hunger to grow. When you when you cross home plate, they don't make you go bad, by the way. Everybody applauds, they don't want to start a run, see. And you don't have to go to bat until you're ready. I like that. And when you're ready, there's a new game. Well, that's a great thing for me. Gods are related to time as an experience in eternity. In the evolutionary universe, eternity is temporal, everlasting, the everlasting now. I think of I think of time as a railroad rail that goes from horizon to horizon for the past and the future. And I think of eternity as a great wheel that's rolling down the trail. And where the wheel touches the rail, that is the moving moment of the everlasting trail. That's where time and eternity impinge. And I feel in my bones that there will always be time. There always has been, there is now, there always will be. You want to know where the, where the, uh, I'm not sure what I found them. I found them and I got them noted in my book. Oh. <coughs> okay.
souls of the cardinal sins of mankind, and it's just also the reason procrastination is put off. Equivocation is straddle. You straddle. You straddle. You, uh, you don't commit you yourself. You, you're no concealed you rather. You never. Uh, never yeah. have a lie. You're like something. You, you, you give them double talk. You, you go concealed rather. Yeah. Insincerity. Well, that's real bad. Problem avoided. Says Carl the hair. I'll think about that tomorrow. Unfairness. You just plain. Subhuman. Ease seeking. You're a definite animal. Animal vestigial traits. I used that in the talk, in the grad commencement talk I gave to you on the Great Lake. I said that I thought there were extremely uh, advantages. And the whole topic of and the whole whiplash of meaning reality on the economic level to help us be less mammalian and more human. To get rid of these things. It makes sense. I just came off of these animals with good things. I thought I thought that was the first. Don't leave her, uh, don't leave out her umbrella. She had no other. I thought we'd get you into the other place for my new years before you take you to the bathroom. You're going to the Because they, 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 they fall down because of the internal dry rot. 
And I can see some real parallels between the Roman Empire and the United States of America. Fast being red on. Mm -hmm. Fast being red I see a loss of craftsmanship, a loss of pride, and performance, stuff in the body. Right? We've got a crazy little organization. We work hard. And you know what makes us the cost of the pay? Even if we were kind of dumb, we have business and we work hard. I even got the girls working there. We just pay for that much money and make them more fun about what we can do. We'll get them to get them young and they say they're not there. At the moment, we have no pregnancy in the world. We'll 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 have no I mean, very funny. I mean, you've got a point where it's just terrifying. I thought you were going to see them. They want to do something. That's going to do some work. I don't know anymore. But they're nothing that's scary. Yeah, they're nothing that's scary. Yeah, they're nothing that's scary. Yeah, they're nothing that's scary. They don't want to make fun of the show. I'll tell you, I'll tell you a frightening thing in okay. here. This is frightening. There will be more if I actually hold it. Yeah. 
and then we become an enslaved people. And you have uh, a planetary imperialism, which lasts until the end of the In other words, you have a, a worldwide empire. So we have, we have a world government only imposed by force. And we go down simply because we give up. Or we're, we're inadequate. Sure. The Romans went down because they never could provide a civil government. The, the, uh, the last Roman that came back to Ryan was children. The last non Christian emperor. And he was named Caesar, which is the number two man in Rome. And this guy suddenly became a scholar, became a terrific general, and then he was eight out of the people. He just cleaned up the wrong problem. So the whole Germans were on all the sides, but they were in the Roman army. So what happens when these soldiers are claiming a justice, which is the top dog, and now he's going to fight a civil war with his first cousin. And that's the last time the Romans ever cleaned up the army, and they were going to fight over the war. In the meantime, everything has gotten rigid. You're a baker. You're born into the baker's room. Because your old man was a baker. And you can be condemned to death if you don't take bread. Uh, you're an alderman of the city. You want to be an alderman, but you're stuck with it. Your old man was an alderman. Because it's breaking you to pass you. But you know what you can get out of being an alderman is to beat it. And put the flesh of your wealth behind you. Take off and join a monetary or something. Uh, you're a sea captain. You have to haul free for the Roman government, eight months out of the year, then you can have for yourself the money. You see that a completely different society. Currency is so debased that civil servants are paid in chips, which enable them to go to warehouses and draw what they need, avoiding them. Silver coins are made out of copper, copper with a thin silver wash on it, to give them that silver share. Inflation is on the final round. Yeah. And then pretty soon, the Romans die out first. The provincials come in from Spain, from Illyria, from Gaul, and they're good men. They maintain the empire. As they begin to play out, then the two towns come in. And their allegiance is not completely Roman. There's a bad blood between the Roman and the And pretty soon there's the crowd first off the line and the to the fire and the entire goes down. They've got to be pretty At no time were the Romans ever unable to whip the Germans on anything like the medium base until they ran out of land. The Romans just had scientific warfare to Germany, which never been mentioned, from the tanks of the But pretty soon no more Roman armies than the <coughs> that's the that's the end of it. In civilization, the weaker, being the more numerous, when they vote, they make it easier and easier and easier for themselves. And it's the stronger the case. And that goes to the and that could have more like that's the case. Exactly right. yeah. It is not pleasant. I just don't get excited about it. I'm concerned about just a couple of things I can make a living for the family. And the rest of the time, I work for the Google. Economic policy, the atom bomb, I don't even need to worry about the things that come back to that. I don't even have to do anything to do with it. I'm a struggle for this thing. I'm not quite sure. It's I love not pleasant. Your name, uh, for your political ideology. It's not pleasant to come with it. Uh, I your name for uh, <coughs> trying to get it into your past, but I need mean, I will say this. To me. I think that the, the greatest thing that's happened to America is Russia. We need a challenge, Brad, because we're getting about, we're getting about like mashed potatoes. Now, Russia's got a scare. And maybe the meeting the Russian challenge will avoid the restriction. I regard Russia as almost indispensable to America's society. 
Now, God knows the Russians don't plan it that way. But that's their unwitting result. Suddenly, it's the greatest thing you could have to do. It shook it. It shook it. And all of a sudden, it's a dream. Competition. They didn't feel fucking with them. They could get real, you know, we're real smug about the atom bomb. It's quite bad. But they didn't quite fuck with them. We still haven't developed the stuff that they got in the room. When Krishna says, we'll bury you. He will. But we don't need sympathy. One of these days, and this I think is going to have a salutary effect on our whole economics. One of these days is going to have to compete with Russian steel in the international market. And at this point, the American Union is going to have to learn a lesson. Maybe so. Maybe so. Correct. Maybe so. Right. Someday we're going to have to elect people who have ideas. An idea. Well, we haven't done too well, I think. Well, the, the president the president is somebody who's about the way I figured he was. He graduated in the middle of his class. He trained as a sad man. He's not a slasher commander. He's, he's no Patton. He's no uh, MacArthur. He's no Eichelberg. He's not even a Montgomery. Here, just to take one. Just to take just to take one idea now, consider this. You know all the things that's made about the Suez Canal. Now, we don't need the Panama Canal. It's not by the our defense anymore. We don't have a one, one ocean navy and two oceans. We've got a big air force. Why in the devil don't we offer the Panama Canal to the United Nations? Unless the UN takes over the Panama Canal bond, you know, let them have the revenue and let them pay off the bonds. We could still use this now if we could use it now. And what a beautiful gesture this is. Because we're not giving away anything that's essential. So the Panama Canal is no longer a strategic necessity. But why the devil, why the devil don't we get smart and, and, and take the initiative? Instead of waiting until the Panamanian uh, giant Castro or something like that. We sit here and we look at dictators in Latin America and we give them medals because it's all peaceful. Then we, we wait and we have a revolution and what have we got? The alternative is not too good. I'd like, I'd like to see, why don't we get an ideology that's based on God? Instead of talking about the American way of life, which adds up to a very crass deal. This means more, more, more marshmallow topping on our Sunday. It means pickle at least plus mustard on our hot dogs and more foam on our automobiles. In other words, a real comfortable life, you know, suburb, security, so on. Why don't we talk about God? This is a safe subject. This creates no controversy with Catholic, Protestant, or Jew, or Mohammedan, or Hindu, or Buddhist. Why don't, we, why don't we fight this on an ideological basis? Those who believe in God versus those who do not believe in God. We need spark plugs. We haven't got it. Well, Exactly the position of a devout Christian in the Middle Ages. 
we're going to go to the line, not because we love God, but we're scared as hell of the devil and hell. We have yet to learn to respond to a good thing. Instead of, instead of reacting to a bad Correct. And we don't know what it's like. Yes, but it's a wonderful run. Yes, so this is outside of my line, so. Damn, put it. Sure. No, I, I don't try to. Huh. I don't fuck around with this sort of thing. I'd like to divide the forces. Yes. Uh, on the little old plane? Yes, we got it. Not that I want to pass it. Bill, you you evaded my question. What's that? Do you foresee? Yes, sir. Hot up there. Forces on this road back in there. He's eventually arriving at that division. Let's just say to heck with nitrous oxygen, we have to put it up. Well, that's worse than that. Everybody line up on this side of the room. Yeah, please. Yeah. 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 This I would hope to have. This, I hope you can do it. I think it's going to be on the top of the road. So we've got to get some work to get some work to get. Well, we haven't done too well lately. Oh, yeah. oh. So you can do it. It's five after six almost. Mm. And, and you uh, still got to do a little thing. You I want to listen to your film? No. Well, you're so this is spending the place there. Oh, my God. <laughs>
than I had a number of years ago. I once had a son who was a walking question mark. And I was pretty talking with him one day. And he said, hey, Fox, he said, uh, this Berlin airlift, what is that all about? Like, for instance. Mm. He said, this, uh, the Korean police action, what, what's that all about? I explained that. He said, every January you get real sight and you consider your income tax. Now, why are you paying so much in tax? I explained in armaments and debt and so forth. Well, he said, didn't we win the last war? Well, I patiently explained that to him, too. And he looked at me and he grinned and he said, as near as I can see, old boy, your generation has loud things up about beyond recovery. And I got to thinking about it. We had loud things up pretty badly. We are a generation that's come along after about 300 years of lopsided growth. You know, the medieval Christian, the black death hit Florence, he bowed his head, and he said, as he buried his family, the Lord give it, the Lord take it away, blessed be the name of the Lord. In the Renaissance and the rediscovery of the Greek viewpoint of life, and men began to say, we don't have to die from the black death. There is something we can do about things in general, and material life in particular. And this was the beginning of the development of a scientific attitude in place of a simple, rather naive, religious acceptance of the vicissitudes of life. The watch cry of the Renaissance was, man is the measure of all things. And so we witnessed the birth of a new civilization, a resurrection of Hellenic culture, if you please, because the Greeks were the first real secular the first people who looked at life and said, we can do something about this. What's got our blessings? Representative government, universal education, an industrial system that gives us the highest, highest standard of living that human beings have ever known, all the material comforts that we have any right to ask for, uh, continued prosperity, but there's something wrong, friends. Along with that, we, are, we have succeeded in killing more people scientifically in my lifetime than have been killed in warfare in the last 2,000 years. We have loud things up. Our growth has been lopsided. We didn't just stop with the development of a scientific attitude. We didn't confine our scientific revolt to a revolt against superstition. We revolted against religion itself, to the point where I know human beings that are afraid of the word religion. They would shrink like wilted lettuce before they'd stand up and say to a group of people, I am a religious man. Now, of course, we're going to have to redefine religion before we get through the people. <coughs> Our growth has been lopsided. We have become so enamored of religion, of, of science, that we are worse than atheists. There's one thing worse than an atheist. That is a secular. An atheist is at least fighting God. He's paying God some attention. He's in opposition. A secularist is too busy to bother about God. He says, well, don't tell me I'm not, uh, don't let my fellow men. I'm going to put more chrome on the car. We're bringing out next year. We're going to cut the price of the dishwasher. We're going to bring out a new plastic. We're improving the standard of living. Uh, I'm, going to, I'm going to give the union what they want in the plant. I'm a, I'm a good guy. But his entire mind his entire life 
His entire thinking is occupied with material, temporal problems. He's full of ideas. He doesn't have too much in the way of ideals. Let me give you a horrible story. You know the story of the American prisoners of war in Korea? You know how they died like flies? These are our GIs, so-called Christians. Do you know the story of the Turkish prisoners of war in Korea? How a bunch of Mohammedans came to? Let me tell you what they did. When the Chinese removed their officers, the non-coms took command. When they removed the non-coms, the senior private took command. When a Turk got sick, three Turks were detailed to nursing 24 hours around the clock. Those Turkish soldiers came through almost to a man without a casualty, which proved that working Mohammedanism is better than sleeping Christianity. Our Christian GIs died. The Mohammedans survived. Even a second-rate religion that's active is better than a passive first-rate religion. <coughs> Willie Griffo said, I wasn't going to talk. I said, three hours and we'll have an altar call. <laughs> uh, I don't mind if any of you look at your watches, but even if you're tempted, please don't take them off and shake them to see if they're still running. That one. We made scientific progress, but we are confronted with religious and philosophic stagnation. I don't believe that you can call 20th century people to the service of God with the battle cries of the Middle Ages. You know, I was talking to one little gal in Chicago about this book, and she pulled this bromide on me, you know what, the religion that's good enough for my parents is good enough for me. And I said, wouldn't that have been a fine position for the twelve apostles to have taken? When Jesus asked them to listen to some new truth, they could have just said, look, we're real conservatives. We're for the law and the prophets and the Pentateuch and the books of Moses and so forth. And uh, dear Carpenter, who are you recruiting elsewhere? We not only have religious stagnation, we have philosophic confusion. Consider the confused ideology of the United States of America as we confront Russia. We're talking about the American way of life, and how do we define it? You have not only piccalilli, but mustard on your hot dog. You have bigger fins on your Cadillac, more chrome on your automobile, a super beauty rest to sleep on. Is this exciting? No. The communistic lies sound better than that. They claim to be fighting for mankind. <coughs> we have philosophic confusion. We look at this world. We do not see the perfection which we think we might see if there were a God. We see imperfection. We see lots of problems and we're inclined to discount religion because the world is not a nice, easy, sweet, perfect place to live in. I'd like to read you something. character desirable. Then must man be reared in an environment which necessitates grappling with hardship and reacting to disappointment. Is altruism, service of one's fellows, desirable? 
then must life experience provide for encountering situations of social inequality. <clears throat> it holds the grandeur of trust desirable. Then human existence must constantly be confronted with insecurity and with recurrent uncertainty. With faith, the supreme assertion of human thought desirable. Then must the mind of man find itself in that troublesome predicament where it ever knows less than it can believe. Is the love of truth and the willingness to go wherever it leads desirable. Then must man grow up in a world where error is present and falsehood always possible. Is idealism, the approaching concept of the divine, desirable? Then must man struggle in an environment of relative goodness and beauty, surrounding stimulating of the irrepressible reach for better things. Is loyalty, devotion to highest duty, desirable? Then must man carry on amid the possibility of betrayal and desertion. The valor of devotion to duty consists in the implied danger of default. It's unselfishness. The spirit of self-forgetfulness desirable. Then must mortal man live face to face with the insistent clamor of an inescapable self for recognition and honor. Man could not dynamically choose the divine life if there were no self-life to forsake. Man could never lay saving hold on righteousness if there were no potential evil to exalt and differentiate the good by contrast. This pleasure, the satisfaction of happiness desirable, then must man live in a world where the alternative of pain and the likelihood of suffering are ever-present experiential possibilities. That is very straight, philosophic reason, I submit. I'd like to offer you, this evening, what is to me one of the most priceless concepts in this book as it deals with the province of science, philosophy, and religion. This I have used many, many times in talking to confused people without necessarily telling them about this book. Consider the largest word you know I would suggest to you that the word is reality. I can't think of a bigger word than reality. That which is real. Let's subdivide reality. Let reality be like a headache, a banner going right across the front page of a newspaper. I want to have three columns under it. And I want to have subheadings under each of these columns. And the three subheadings are things, meanings, and values. Reality comes in three different packages. There are things, there are meanings, there are values. Where religion makes its mistake is that it seeks to make pronouncements concerning things. Religion is not concerned with things. It's not concerned with the origin of species or with the origin of this world. One is a proper subject for genetics and anthropology. The other is a proper study of astrophysics, astronomy, and geology. Scientists are equally 
fat-headed, when they are so unscientific as to make pompous, unprovable statements concerning religion. As scientists, they are concerned solely with things. We approach each of these realities with a different technique. If you're dealing with things, use reason, mathematics, a scientific approach. But if you're in the domain of value, there is no mathematics to value. Tell me, concerning altruistic love, what is its mass, its velocity, its amplitude, its hue, its wavelength, its dimension? The whole concept of mathematics becomes ridiculous when we apply it to the domain of that. In the domain of values, you can use faith. I would submit to you that things and values touch at no point, but both touch the area of meaning. And in the area of meaning, we use neither reason nor faith, but we try to use logic. And here is where we attempt the construction of an original, interesting, and engaging philosophy, which reaches out on the one hand to the same concept, and on the other hand to the value ideal, and attempts to present us with a unified picture of the cosmos. To science, the absolute is a first cause. In religion, a loving father. In philosophy, a universal unity. The great confusion, I think, in the thinking of modern man is the confusion of things, meaning, and value. I remember many years ago, I had a couple of pretty sick children. And <coughs> I got a good pediatrician on the job. And afterwards, I was out looking at the stars and snowing. And I had an urge to pray. And I said, all right, Willie, you're a typical human being. You're in a jam. What are you going to do, try to practice magic? You know, when you ask God to do things for your sake, this is the attempt to practice magic. Magic is the effort to bend the universe to your will and plans and purpose. And much of praying is nothing more than a modern practice of magic. Not too successful. I said, no, if you ask God to cure those kids, Knowing what you know and feeling as you do, that would be blasphemy. I don't say that about any other human being, but to me, for me to pray that way would be blasphemy. So I said, I still want to pray. What am I going to pray for? I have no right to pray in the domain of things. This is not a fit province for prayer. Then it hit me. These children could not be permanently harmed. They might die, that's true, but this is not final. And then I found out what I could properly pray for, and it was a prayer of thanksgiving, that this universe was so constructed that if I couldn't keep these children on earth, they'd be decently cared for and could embark on a very interesting adventure in eternity. People are worried about religion, confused about it, because it attempts to act irreligiously. It invades the domain of science and philosophy, 
it makes pronouncements concerning unity, concerning facts. It has no business operating in these areas. I remember when my children were growing up, they came bounding in one day and they said, Daddy, what do we pray for? Well, I said, you know, you have two fathers, don't you? No, no. Well, I said, you got me and you got your father in heaven. No, I said, take a good look at me. I'm corporeal, material. Your father in heaven isn't those things. Then we define it in terms of all the sensory mechanisms. See, touch, taste, smell, and so forth. I said, if you want something material, don't ask your father in heaven for it. And I said, I think he could get it for you. But as I observe the way the universe is set up, he delegated this. And if he hadn't delegated it, I wouldn't have a job. So if you want a pony, don't pray. Discuss it with me. You're much more apt to get a pony. But I said, if you want something that is not material, again, through the sensory mechanism, then I said, don't ask me. Well, they said, what would that be? I said, courage. I don't know how to make you any braver than you are. Happiness. I don't know how to make you any happier than you are. Kindness. I can keep you warm and I can feed you. I don't know how to make you more kind than you are. These things you talk to your other father about. I make my living looking at people, evaluating them, studying them, and I'd like to make a flat statement. There are just two traits which human beings have that animals do not have even in vestigial form. One is a sense of humor and the other is a sense of religion. And I would submit to you that a human being who is deficient in humor and has no religion is somewhat infra-human. He is verging towards the purely mammalian or subhuman level of existence. I'm not only not afraid to say I have a religion, I am prepared to say that a person who lacks one is in danger of classifying himself as a mammal. <coughs> when you put all this together, now when I give this altar call, Griff, will you lead the procession? You always have to have a Judas joke, you know. Uh, I can't think of a better way of describing how this works in life than to read you their description of the life of the sanest human being I think that ever lived. And he had a good sense of humor too. Even though the Commonwealth of Israel, first century AD, gave him very little chance to express it. <coughs> Although the average human being cannot hope to attain the high perfection of character which Jesus of Nazareth acquired while sojourning in the flesh, it is altogether possible for any human being to develop a strong and unified personality along the perfected line of Jesus' personality. The unique feature of the Master's personality was not so much its perfection as its symmetry, its exquisite and sound unification. The most effective presentation of Jesus consists in following the example of the one who said, as he gestured toward the master standing before his accusers, Behold the man. The unfailing kindness of Jesus touched the hearts of men, but his stalwart strength of character amazed his followers. 
He was truly sincere. There was nothing of the hypocrite in him. He was free from affectation. He was always so refreshingly genuine. He never stooped to pretend, and he never resorted to shamming. He lived the truth, even as he talked. He was the truth. He was constrained to proclaim saving truth to his generation, even though such sincerity sometimes caused pain. He was unquestioningly loyal to all truth. But the Master was so reasonable, so approachable. He was so practical in all his ministry. While all his plans were characterized by such sanctified common sense. He was so free from all freakish, erratic, and eccentric tendencies. He was never capricious, whimsical, or hysterical. In all his teaching, and in everything he did, there was always an exquisite discrimination associated with an extraordinary sense of propriety. The Son of Man was always a well-poised personality. Even his enemies maintained a wholesome respect for him. They even feared his presence. Jesus was unafraid. He was surcharged with divine enthusiasm, but he never became fanatical. He was emotionally active, but never flighty. He was imaginative, but always practical. He frankly faced the realities of life, but he was never dull or prosaic. He was courageous, but never reckless, prudent, but never cowardly. He was sympathetic, but not sentimental, unique, but not eccentric. He was pious, but not sanctimonious. And he was so well poised because he was so perfectly unified. <laughs> Jesus' originality was unstifled. He was not bound by tradition or handicapped by enslavement to narrow conventionality. He spoke with undoubted confidence and taught with absolute authority. But his superb originality did not cause him to overlook the gems of truth in the teachings of his predecessors and contemporaries. And the most original of his teachings was the emphasis of love and mercy in the place of fear and sacrifice. Jesus was very broad in his outlook. He exhorted his followers to preach the gospel to all people. He was free from all narrow-mindedness his sympathetic heart embraced all mankind, even a universe. Always his invitation was, whosoever will, let him come. Of Jesus, it was truly said, he trusted God. As a man among men, he most sublimely trusted the Father in heaven. He trusted his Father as a little child, trusts his earthly parents, his faith was perfect, but never presumptuous. No matter how cruel nature might appear to be, or how indifferent the man's welfare on earth, Jesus never faltered in his faith. He was immune to disappointment and impervious to persecution. He was untouched by apparent failure. He loved men as brothers at the same time recognizing how they differed in innate endowment and acquired quality. He went about doing good. Jesus was an unusually cheerful person, but he was not a blind and unreasoning optimist. His constant word of exhortation was, be of good cheer. He could maintain this confident attitude because of his unswerving trust in God and his unshakable confidence in man. He was always touchingly considerate of all men, 
because he loved them and believed in them. Still, he was always true to his conviction and magnificently firm in his devotion to the doing of his father's will. The master was always gentle. He never grew weary of saying, he is more blessed to give than to receive, said he. Freely you have received, freely give. And yet with all of his unbounded generosity, he was never wasteful or extravagant. He taught that you must believe to receive salvation. For everyone who seeks shall receive. He was candid, but always kind. Said he, if it were not so, I would have told you. He was frank, but always friendly. He was outspoken in his love for the sinner and in his hatred for sin. But throughout all this amazing frankness, he was unerringly fair. Jesus was consistently cheerful. Notwithstanding, he sometimes drank deep of the cup of human sorrow. He fearlessly faced the realities of existence, yet was he filled with enthusiasm for the gospel of the kingdom. But he controlled his enthusiasm. It never controlled him. He was unreservedly dedicated to the Father's business. This divine enthusiasm led his unspiritual brethren to think he was beside himself, that the onlooking universe appraised him as the model of sanity and the pattern of supreme mortal devotion to the high standards of spiritual living. And his controlled enthusiasm was contagious. His associates were constrained to share his divine optimism. This man of Galilee was not a man of sorrow. He was a soul of gladness. Always was he saying, Rejoice and be exceedingly blessed. But when duty required, he was willing to walk courageously through the valley of the shadow of death. He was glad to, but at the same time humble. His courage was equaled only by his patience. When pressed to act prematurely, he would only reply, my hour has not yet come. He was never in a hurry. His composure was sublime. But he was often indignant at evil, intolerant of sin. He was often mightily moved to resist that which was inimical to the welfare of his children on earth. But his indignation against sin never led to anger at the sinner. His courage was magnificent, but he was never foolhardy. His watchword was fear not. His bravery was lofty and his courage often heroic, but his courage was linked with discretion and controlled by reason. It was courage born of faith, not the recklessness of blind presumption. He was truly brave, but never audacious. The master was a pattern of reverence. The prayer of even his youth began. Our Father who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. He was even respectful of the faulty worship of his fellows. But this did not deter him from making attacks on religious traditions or assaulting errors of human belief. He was reverential of true holiness, and yet he could justly appeal to his fellow saying, Who among you convicts me of sin? Jesus was great because he was good, and yet he fraternized with the little children. He was gentle and unassuming in his personal life. And yet he was the perfected man of a universe. His associates called him master, unbidden. Jesus was the 
perfectly unified human personality. And today, as in Galilee, he continues to unify mortal experience and to coordinate human endeavors. He unifies life in noble character and simplifies experience. He enters the human mind to elevate, transform, and transfigure it. It is literally true. If any man has Christ Jesus within him, he is a new creature. All things are passing away. Behold, all things are becoming new. I really won't use the three-hour sermon tonight. I think it would be fun if we could talk a little bit. I wanted to talk to you just enough, read you just enough, to get you stirred up. Are there any questions you'd like to ask? Oh, first said that I define religion. I'll try this. I once collected around 30 different definitions of religion, all by different authorities, and no two agree. I would define religion. Better still, let me let me describe my religion. Should I do that? I can do that more simply. Somewhere at the center of all things is the boss. And down here on earth are the boss's children, and they should be treated accordingly. That's my reason. If you want me to discuss my theology with you, it'll take more than three hours. But my religion is a very simple one. Somewhere at the center of all things is the boss. Down here are the boss's children. They should be treated accordingly. The formal definition of religion is this, some kind of a belief in some kind of a supreme being, some kind of hope of immortality, and some kind of ethics deriving from the relationship of God to other men. Most religions will qualify on that basis. Now, the minute you leave God and man's relation to God, no two religions are in agreement. Come in some questions. Someone has something on their mind. Somebody may be. Lord, if you disagree with some of this, let's have at it. That is that is a good thing. Yeah. Somebody wants to stand up and just says, I think you're you're crazy as a loon. Well, we'll discuss relative sanity then. I'm <laughs> confident on that subject, too. All right, they want to challenge you on any of your definitions. Sure. You want me to read just some more from there? I'm reading from the Rancher book. Hmm? Oh. Uh, I'll tell you, this last section I read is uh, on page 1101. <coughs> it's the entire end of the paper. It's section 7, entitled The Acme of Religious Living. The first thing I read you is uh, page 51, starting with... Uh, Paragraph 5. These statements are introduced with the statement, All evolutionary creature life is beset by certain inevitability. Consider the following. And we call these nine points the inevitability. Courage, faith, hope, altruism, and so forth. Question. This book tells us that Uranus is the name of this world. <clears throat> it's their name for this world. 
the universe supervises me. This, this book claims to be written by people that do not have skin on it. Do I make myself clear? <laughs> no, it claims, it claims authorship of superhuman. I might as well say that right out in front of everybody. That's sort of like admitting you're illegitimate. When you call yourself a bastard, well, I mean, what, what, can, what can they say after that? I mean, you said it. We might as well get this one out on the table. <laughs> now, they name themselves in here. Yes. But they're not any names that I ever ran into before, except in the scriptures. Correct. That's correct. This book is written in, it's written in four parts. <clears throat> Say that again. In part. Yeah. <clears throat> they write about God, the universe. Well, they, they don't base it particularly on the Bible. They base it on their own personal experience. In part, yes. And part of it's a long ways away, too. This book starts out at the center of all things and deals with the subject of God. It proceeds outward, dealing with his associates. It covers the central universe and comes on out into the evolutionary creation. He finally gets down to talk about this planet. He gives the history of this planet, and the latter third of the book is devoted to the life and teachings of Jesus. <coughs> and the book apologizes for dealing with things and says it will shortly be out of date when further scientific discoveries are made. Mm -hmm. It doesn't claim uh, infallibility in that area. <coughs> that's one way of looking at it, yes. Yes, they're quite apologetic when they're dealing with physical things. As they say, the best we can do is to give you a unified picture as of about where you are now. And this will shortly stand in the revision because we cannot anticipate the discoveries of the next 500 years. This would be unearned information. <coughs> when, when I use the word people, I am not referring to human beings. I'm referring to uh, superhuman beings. Question. You know, years ago I used to wonder how... I, years ago, I used to think about what would happen when this was published, and I said to myself, Willie, are you going to have guts enough to stand up in front of people and tell them that this is a revelation that wasn't written by people? And here I am saying it. Does, does somebody have a point over here? <coughs> I'd like to ask you a question. Don't you think the English is rather lovely? The whole book is written in a style that I find very engaging. I'd rather tell them here, fine. The, uh, as far as I can tell, this book is what it claims to be. I am a very unlikely person to be associated with something like this because I'm a natural-born skeptic. I'm not a natural believer. And for a long time, I thought, how can I express an opinion about this book which is totally defensible? And here is the... Here's the way I elect to word this opinion. If this book 
is not what it claims to be. I can't prove it. And I've had an excellent opportunity to investigate it for more than 20 years. <clears throat> One of the first things that I checked into many years ago was where is the gold-plated Cadillac? 